Can you welcome back to the 127 Fit podcast? Today's guest is the online editor for Muscular Development. He is also senior writer for Muscular Development. Today's guest is Ron Harris. Ron, I want to welcome you to the 127 Fit podcast. Thank you so much for having me and appreciate your support sharing the Instagram stories and things like that for uh, the content that I do for MD. Appreciate that a lot. For, for sure, Ron. And uh, I just really appreciate all the content that you and uh, Muscular Development put out. And I'm a huge podcast guy, so uh, there's constant content. So I, I greatly appreciate what you guys are doing over there at Muscular Development. So, um, Ron, I just want to jump into what I like to call the warm-up questions. I've got four questions that I like to ask all of my guests just to kind of get the conversational ball rolling, so to speak. Uh, the first question that I have for you is how do you start your day? Do you have a specific routine or ritual you like to stick to on most mornings? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm 51 years old, but I'm still a, a bodybuilder at heart. So every day is Groundhog Day. Uh, wake up, eat my breakfast. It's always the same breakfast. It's four whole eggs, bowl of oatmeal, some collagen powder in there, coffee with a little bit of Redcon 1 protein powder mixed in, all my vitamins. Then I uh, walk my dog, Branch, for about 30, 40 minutes, come back, check a few emails, and then I uh, head off to the gym. Awesome, man. That, that definitely sounds like a, a, a bodybuilder morning routine, right? <laughs> Um, sure. Really, really quick. I just want to touch on that breakfast because obviously a lot of the people that are going to be listening to this specific episode are going to be uh, into bodybuilding or at least interested in bodybuilding. So with the, with the whole eggs, the oatmeal, you said you had the Redcon uh, protein and the collagen. Um, what's kind of the purpose? Is there anything specifically purposeful about that uh, breakfast? Yeah, I also forgot in the oatmeal, there's always a big, big handful of blueberries too. I, I like to start the day with a, a really big meal because that's that's my pre-workout meal. You'll hear people say, oh, I need to eat two or three or four meals before I train. I've been doing it on one meal most of my life. And uh, to me, it works out fine as long as the meal is substantial. So I want pro the, the whole eggs. You know, you get a lot of benefits with the yolk and, and the, uh, the white. But I'm also wanting more calories and more fat. So this all digests. This is a lot of food. It's the two biggest meals I eat every day are my pre-workout meal, which is breakfast and my post-workout meal. Those are definitely the two biggest meals I eat because I believe that's when the food gets utilized the most. So you want a lot of good food in your system to get you through the workout, provide all that fuel. And then, you know, I have a shake after the workout and then hour, hour and a half later, I have a really big meal. It's, it's always chicken and rice. Perfect. Now, uh, I just want to quickly touch on the collagen. Is that something that you've um, uh, kind of incorporated in your diet for a long time, or is it just a recent addition? And then either way, kind of like ha what type of benefits have you seen specifically from the collagen, Ron? It's probably only been about six months. They started selling it at Costco in these big tubs. So it made sense. Uh, it's, you know, for, for joint repair, uh, things like that. And my joints are shot. I've lost a lot of cartilage. I have no cartilage left in one of my shoulders. So at this point, it's, it's anything that can help me with joint support, soft tissue support, the, the, the joints, the, the ligaments, the tendons, all that stuff, because that's what really starts to go as the years go by. If you've been training hard and heavy for many years, it's, it's your joints and connective tissues that really, that really go on you, I find, just from overuse. It's just wear and tear. For sure, for sure. All right, so um, the next question uh, in regards to the warm-up questions, do you have a favorite quote, mantra, or word? I've had the same one for about 35 years now or more. It's the five Ps. This was taught to me by, I was in junior ROTC, Marine Corps junior ROTC in ninth and 10th grade. And uh, our instructor had been a, a door gunner in Vietnam. It was master uh, gunnery sergeant, Will Duggan. He taught us the five Ps. Prior planning prevents poor performance. And I've tried to live my life by that, or at least incorporate that into most of the things that I do, because I find that if you're prepared, you spend a little time getting things ready ahead of time, you're not caught in a, a lurch and you're ready for whatever task or situation that you're supposed to be ready for. Awesome. Yeah, one, one of the one of the, kind of the sayings that I have in my own life is prep, preparation creates opportunity. Uh, I really think on, on any level of life, 
if you're prepared, man, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be ready for anything that life throws at you, so to speak. So I, I love the five P's. That's cool. Um, now the third question in regards to the warm up, is there a book or podcast that has been especially impactful in your life? And um, if, if there hasn't really been anything too specific, we'll just kind of transition that question into um, kind of like the Ron, my report and kind of some of the podcasts that you have on muscular development. So um, kind of however you want to take it on. Yeah, I've read a lot of those uh, self-help type of books and I, I've gotten a little bit out of every single one of them for sure. The last one I read was Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. Uh, I didn't even finish it because it was a, I get, I get most of my books from the library and if I don't read them in two weeks, the new books, I have to bring them back. So I got to get that one out and finish that one. But uh, yeah, I think all those, most of those books have something to offer and I've definitely gleaned a little bit from every single one of them. Cool. Is there a, I mean, I know there's like the Arnold Schwarzenegger Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. I know Chris Aceto's written a couple books, but is there maybe like a bodybuilding specific book, maybe from back in the day, so to speak, that um, you've read or you've heard has a lot of valuable information for maybe some of the listeners to, to possibly check out? The Arnold Encyclopedia is a must. I think every bodybuilder should own a copy of that. It's got, geez, just one part of it. It has so much content, but there's a long section of training chapters with body parts and hundreds of exercises shown. Um, the book that, the, the two books that I read as an 18 year old that really made an impact on me were the Nautilus Advanced Bodybuilding book, which I read first, should have been the other way around, then the Nautilus Bodybuilding book. So Arthur Jones and Ellington Darden wrote those books and they were ahead of their time as far as promoting the, the importance of recovery good form, you know, really good form, things like that, proper rep tempo, things that really wouldn't be popularized until Dorian Yates became Mr. Olympia. And that's when people started paying a lot more attention to recovery and taking a little more rest. And I had that mentality from the beginning because of those books. I also was brainwashed into thinking Nautilus machines were the only viable training tools available, the free weights for these obsolete things. But uh, yeah, those, those two books made a big impact on me for sure. I was I just turned 18 years old. I just got my first copy of Flex Magazine, tore out a bunch of pictures and taped them to my wall, my dorm room wall in UC Santa Barbara. And uh, it got me so fired up, those, those two books and, and the magazines. Love it. Now, I do want, to, because like, I, like we kind of mentioned in the opening here, um, you know, I, I listen to uh, your podcast, uh, Ron Line Report. There's the uh, Lavrone Report. There's No Way, Jose with Jose Raymond. There's global muscle radio on uh, muscular development and stuff. So I, I uh, consume a, a lot of content off of muscular development. So let's just focus on Ron Line Report because that's kind of like your own podcast, so to speak. Um, what's kind of the uh, impetus uh, behind that podcast? And, and just what's kind of been something maybe that you've taken away from doing so many episodes of, of the Ron Line Report? It's, it's an interview show. And, you know, I've been I've been writing since geez, my first article was published in 92, 1992, the last century. But uh, it, it's just another way to get the interviews and the, with the athletes out there, the profiles, because magazines, you know, I, I resisted this, this trend. And there's not, you can't fight progress. You can't fight evolution. And things have gone digital. Paper magazines, we're the last, Muscular Development's the last, the last magazine to print a paper magazine every month right now. All the other ones I used to, to love reading every month, Flex, Muscle and Fitness, Iron Man, Muscle Mag, Muscle Media 2000, Planet Muscle, they're all gone now. Um, so I, I realized if I wanted to still reach people and get the athletes uh, publicity and things like that, I had to do it digitally. And when I, I got the job as online editor, of course, that was my main responsibility was I'm basically in charge of making sure we have plenty of good content for the MD YouTube channel. And um, the Ron Line Report, I just want to give credit to the name, the late Peter McGuff, who was a friend and mentor of mine, and I miss him so dearly. There's, he was one of a kind, greatest bodybuilding writer there ever was, ever will be. He came up with the idea in a, in a, a conference call that we had. At the time, I thought it was so silly. I said, Ron Line Report, Ugh, people are going to roast me for this. Um, but now I, now I kind of like it. It sounds, you know, what else would you call it, really? <laughs> for sure. No, I, I, I think it's great. And, uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I really enjoy the, the interviews and, and that's kind of a cool thing. Like I, 
I mean, cause like, obviously I've been doing my podcast for almost three years and there's so many different podcasts out there, but still, uh, obviously, uh, Fuad has his podcast and, and, uh, there's some more bodybuilders that are doing the podcast thing, but still, I just, I, I feel like there's a, a lot of room for growth within the bodybuilding community in regards to just interviewing the athletes. You know what I mean? Cause like, that's really what the magazines did for us back in the day. They kind of, you know, uh, gave us a picture into behind the scenes of, you know, the training regimen, the eating kind of the lifestyle a little bit, but now with, you know, social media and the podcast, we can really, you know, talk to these athletes one-on-one -on -one and really get behind the scenes uh, that you didn't always get with the magazines. Cause the magazines were a little, you know, uh, they kind of showed you just what they wanted to show you. Right. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for, for growth within the bodybuilding podcast scene. And we're starting to see that growth, but um, again, uh, keep, keep up the great work, Ron, because I, I really enjoy it. I know there's a lot of other people out there that enjoy listening to those interviews that you do uh, with the bodybuilding athlete. So um, I just kind of want to wrap up these warm-up questions, Ron, um, with this uh, last question. What is one piece of advice you would give your younger self? It would be believe in yourself. Don't think that you can't do something. Uh, don't, there's more than one piece of advice. Don't be so uh, worried about what other people think of you and don't be afraid to fail. And I, I would have a lot of advice to my younger self because, you know, when, you, when you're my age, I'm 51, almost 52, you look back, you think about how you were as a, as a young man, 18, 19, 20, 21. And, you know, you wish you could go back in time and, and impart some of that wisdom, some of the experience, some of the things that you've learned in the, in the decades that have passed. You know, we can't, but to anyone out there, I, I, I think we're in a good place now because there, but those messages do get out there. I think social media has been a wonderful thing because, yeah, there's a lot of negativity, but there's also a lot of empowering messages out there. There's a lot of positivity that didn't exist. You know, if you were, if you were a young man with no confidence back in the day, there weren't a lot, you know, maybe you could go to the bookstore and, and pick up a book or two or something, but geez, there's YouTube, there's a million YouTube channels you can look to for inspiration and motivation and guidance now. Yeah, but uh, there's also something to be said for learning things the hard way because you certainly appreciate it a lot more when you've when you've made all the mistakes. Absolutely. Um, I, and, and just to piggyback off of that question, what's what's like a, a piece of advice or maybe a couple pieces of advice you give your younger self in regards to bodybuilding? I don't think I would. I w I'm actually glad I was naive to a lot of things back in the day. Um, maybe we talk, touch on it later, but I, I had no awareness of steroids when I started. So I didn't have any limiting beliefs that I couldn't get bigger or stronger without them. So I just ate and lifted and got bigger and stronger. Whereas I get contacted all the time from young guys who haven't even started training it or they're just started training and they're asking me, what's a good cycle? Where do I get this? How much should I use of that? And it, it kind of makes me sad that They've achieved nothing yet naturally, and they don't think they can. Either that or they're in such a mad rush. But it's not, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's a lifetime. If you want to be doing this for your whole life, and I know that's something that's very hard to even, hmm, even process to a, young, a very young man of being. When you're 18, you can't imagine being 30. Forget about 40 and 50. But longevity is, is a wonderful thing. To be able to do this for your whole life, and, you know, I run into all these guys my age who say, I used to look like you or I used to do that, but they don't do it anymore. And they don't look like that now. They burnt out for whatever reason. They said, oh, I tried the juice. And I think getting into drugs early is a huge mistake. Uh, I know it's it's common. It's commonplace now. It's it's almost more common than not. But I, I would I would tell these guys stay natural for a while, at least a few years. Learn your body. Learn how it responds to, to nutrition, different training variables master your training, get a good muscle mind connection. If you do that and make a lot of good gains naturally, then you introduce gear into the equation. I believe you'll get long, you'll get better long-term results. The gear is a very, very satisfying instantaneous reward, which goes along with everything the culture and society are about now. It's, everything's fast now. Everything's so speed of light. But uh, everyone, I almost everyone I know that started off super super quickly into the gear they burnt out very fast they quit bodybuilding you know with the exception of some pros who started out as teenagers and they're you know they're 30 or older now most of the people i've known 
who got into gear fast. They, they burnt out very fast too. Yeah, and, and I want you to, because you talk a lot, uh, about this a lot, Ron, on the different platforms that you have uh, on, on uh, muscular development stuff, but I, I hear you say this a lot, but I, I want you to touch on a little bit more. And, and obviously, again, we're gonna have people interested uh, in bodybuilding, probably some, some younger listeners listening to this, but you said it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And, and, and you kind of said this or alluded to it, like, you know, that, that flies in the face of our culture nowadays, right? Like we live in this, this insta world where it's like anything you want, we can literally have it, it's, it's at our fingertips. But in, specifically in regards to bodybuilding, um, you know, like why, why is it important to kind of like look at bodybuilding as a long game as opposed to a short game, whether that's talking about the drugs or the nutrition or just the training, like why is it important to kind of have that mindset? Like, Hey, if I'm going to get into bodybuilding, this is a long game. It's not an Insta game or a short game. Because, you know, a, a physique, a, a good physique, an exceptional physique. And I think I would imagine that should be everyone's goal is to have a physique that stands out above the average physique in a gym. Why would you, why would you want to just do all this and train hard and eat, eat six times a day and make sure you get your rest just to look like the guy next to you at the gym. I want to look better. You know, I want to look the best I possibly can. It's me versus me. But at the end of the day, you still want to have a physique where people see you and they immediately know, Oh, wow. There's a bodybuilder. That guy's, they might instantly think drugs, 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 but they'll also on some level understand there was a lot of hard work and time that went into that. And you can't build a physique like that very quickly. It takes time. Even with, uh, even with drugs, it takes a couple of years to build a really good physique, at least a couple of years, two to five years. You know, the exceptions would be, and that's another thing is we've sort of had our mind warped by the genetic freaks. And I'm sort of responsible for that because I've written thousands of articles about the pros over the years. And they're amazing for inspiration and motivation, but they're not something that you should use as a measuring stick for yourself because geez we got people that like dennis james the first 30 days he trained as a teenager he put on 30 pounds of muscle you know that's not going to happen to you guys i don't know if he was on drugs or wasn't i'm saying even with drugs nobody none of you out there unless you're one of that rare half of one percent or less is going to make gains like that if you do it's fat and water it's not muscle and you can't rush something that's great you just can't you can't build a Taj Mahal in a week, you know, you might be able to build a, a shed or something, but you're not building anything that's, that's going to be uh, outstanding or exceptional. For sure. Well, that's, that's, that's great, great advice and, and a great point. Um, kind of at this point in our conversation, Ron, I want to transition into your backstory. That's a, a big part of uh, the 127 Fit podcast. I love kind of getting the backstory of my guests because we are uh, today uh, in large part, um, you know, we, we are today who we, who we uh, were when we were younger and, and those experiences and the adults in our, in our lives uh, during childhood shaped who we are today in, in large part. So if you don't mind sharing with myself and the 127 Fit Podcast listeners, um, where did you grow up? What did those younger years look like? Did you have any siblings? Um, just to kind of touch on um, just kind of like life for, for Ron Harris, maybe up to high school, and then we'll kind of transition from there. Sure. I grew up in a city called Waltham, Massachusetts. It's about 10 miles west of Boston. Uh, I was one of seven. My mother was married once before my dad. So I have, I had uh, three older brothers, two older sisters, one sister passed away uh, and one younger brother who's got the same dad as me. I was really into things like horror movies, drawing. I was a really, really good artist. I was actually class artist in my high school yearbook even though I stopped drawing and painting shortly after high school, got more into writing. Um, small kid, wasn't really athletic at all. Um, so that, that's, where, that's where the weight training, sort of the impetus for that came in because uh, I started messing around weights at 13, 14. We had some weights at the house. Uh, two of my older brothers kind of messed around with them at one point for a little while. But I used to watch uh, pro wrestling on TV before it was a big deal. It was so low budget back when I started watching it. It was on like Saturday morning at, you know, 11 in the morning or something. And I'd see these guys like uh, superstar Billy Graham, Superfly Snuka, uh, Ivan Putsky, Polish Power. There were guys with these rugged, big rugged physiques. And uh, when I was eight years old, I think it was, 
Yeah, it would have been 1978. I was up late at night babysitting my niece and Pumping Iron came on PBS, uh, the, the public public station, Channel 2 in Boston, GBH. And I had never seen, I'd seen the wrestlers, but these guys had a different look to them. The bodybuilders it was Arnold, Franco, Lou Ferrigno, um, Mike Katz, Robbie Robinson in that movie. And I was just blown away by the look. And, you know, it would be a few more years until I really got into quote unquote bodybuilding. But by the time I was 14, I was training regularly, not legs. I didn't touch legs till I was 18, but I was, I was uh, doing it probably four or five times a week, not really knowing what I was doing, just bench presses, curls, whatever I could, whatever I could figure out on my own. But I knew I wanted to be bigger and stronger. Um, you know, I was hoping to get, hoping to get more attention from the girls because I wasn't getting much. I was very short. I started ninth grade at four foot 11, 95 pounds, graduated at five, eight, 140. So, you know, I didn't, I didn't put a ton of muscle on in those years, but it was enough, it was enough that I, I could see something was happening. Uh, and I knew if I kept going, I was determined to keep going until I looked a lot bigger and stronger, however long it took, however hard it was going to be, I wasn't going to give up. And I, that was my thing. I was never going to give up. Well, uh, you know, like when you first kind of saw uh, pumping iron and stuff and you said you were watching the wrestlers and stuff and there was like a different type of physique was it just something like instantly once you saw you know Arnold and 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 Frank and all, all those guys in pumping iron was it just something like instantly that just like grabbed your attention you're like that's what I want well you know what now that I think of it and I don't I've actually never thought of this connection before when I saw the wrestlers I never in my wildest dreams thought these guys I thought they just looked like that I thought these big muscles just you know, just like people are short or tall, just naturally, I thought these guys are just big and muscular. That's how they're, that's how they look. But when I saw pumping iron, they were training scenes. So I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. Something must've clicked in my brain where I said, even though I was only eight years old and I was still a few years away from starting, something must've clicked in my brain that these weights and the training, that's what makes these guys look like that. And you know, that, that must've, that seed must've been in my mind for a few more years before I finally finally started training myself but that that had to be it you just cracked the code <laughs> there you go now uh what did you uh did you play any sports or were you involved in uh kind of like any you know, extracurricular activities uh you know middle school high school or not ron so i tried baseball as a kid i was horrible didn't la only lasted one season the only sport i played well let's see ninth and tenth grade when i was in the rotc this wasn't a sport but I was on the drill team where we did all the tricks with the rifles, like spinning them around and throwing them to each other in the air and catching them and making a lot of noise with the heels and the rifle butts on the ground. Did that for two years. We won some awards, but the only sport I ever actually played uh, just before sometime in the fall of my senior year of high school, my friend Darren said, you want to go out for wrestling? I said, we have a wrestling team because they got no love. We had, I don't know, a dozen sports at my school, Football was king. Basketball was a big deal. Hockey was a big deal. We had a wrestling team, and I guess, you know, they didn't get a lot of uh, publicity. So I did that for a year. I was okay. I wasn't outstanding. I had no coaching. Uh, I don't want to throw the guy into the bus. I don't even remember the coach's name, but he worked with the varsity players or the varsity teammates. And I was on the junior varsity because the guy who was my weight class, Carl, another senior, he was captain of the team. I wasn't going to take his place. So there was no coaching. We were sort of left to our own devices in the corner. And we try to watch what he was telling the other kids. But yeah, I, I'm sure I could have been a little better with some with some coaching. But it was fun. Yeah. I, was, I wasn't bad. I just wasn't that great. I think my I think my record was like five and two. They let me okay. wrestle in seven matches. So yeah. What about yeah. the um because we're gonna get into obviously, you know, if you uh, writing for the magazine and all the articles that you've had published over the years we're going to get into kind of the writing but you kind of mentioned like uh, uh like drawing and, and a more artistic side when you're younger um did you did you kind of like were you involved in like any type of art activities or anything when you're younger and then when did that kind of when did that kind of fall to the wayside and then how did you kind of get interested then in in into writing yeah, I never, I never did anything with the, with the art outside of school. I was, as a, as a junior, I think I was actually contemplating art school. And uh, I hung out with a few uh, kids who were uh, two grades older than me. And some of them did go to art school. And they were much, I, I recognized that they were much better than I was and that they were more devoted to it. I was pretty good. I wasn't a great artist. I was pretty good, but I didn't, 
it was just a hobby. You know, at the same, same time I was writing, I, I had little journals. I, I, I have, luckily I have a couple of them. And I look at little short stories I wrote when I was, you know, 14, 13, 14 years old. And they're hilarious to look at now. But I started to enjoy the writing more because I found I was better at crafting things on a page than I was with a pencil or a paintbrush. Uh, it just seemed seemed to me there was more opportunity for more to create my own worlds uh, with words, less boundaries than there were. And I'm sure if I had been more devoted to art, I could have been better at it. I just couldn't see myself doing that as a career where writing to me, I, you know, movies were always my thing. I love movies, especially horror movies. So my fantasy back then was to be a, a horror movie writer director. That was my thing. And I ended up going to film school. Okay, well, let's uh, let's talk about that a little bit because also um, I know uh, one of the I can't remember the name of it on uh, muscular development, but I know one of the ladies that's a part of uh, you know muscular development. She has a little show where she kind of goes behind the scenes, and she did an interview with you. And I know uh, it's Jen Jen Jerisi, yeah. Who is it? Jen Jerisi. She's our uh, chief operating officer for Advanced Research Media. Okay, yeah, because she she does a great job of kind of going behind the scenes with some of you at muscular development. And, and I love her little episodes that she puts out every once in a while. But I know on there, she had mentioned something about you had written a book. So let's talk about, uh, you know, going going to school. And then let's also talk about, since we're kind of on, on the subject of the writing, let's let's talk about the, the book that you've written. And just, I, I want to, obviously, this, it's a big part of who you are, right? The, the bodybuilding, but there's also this, this writing side of, of, of Ron Harris. And I, I think it's kind of fascinating because I'm also, I consider myself a writer and I love writing and I, I feel like I have a natural gift and knack for it. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of people don't. So um, talk about going off to school and then talk about, you know, writing this book and then just kind of like talk about what writing does for you, kind of what it, it means to you outside of just writing articles, you know, you know, in regards to bodybuilding. Yeah, uh, real quick, I, I don't know if you were going to get to it, but I should probably cover what I, what got me into this industry. Are you going to get there eventually? Yeah, let's let's uh, <laughs> let's trans let's talk about this the school and the writing, and then we'll. Uh, okay, so let's the the school. I went to school for film film studies at UC Santa Barbara, and then I transferred to Emerson College in Boston with a mass communications slash film was my uh, was my emphasis. So it was a lot of film classes, a lot of writing classes, uh, things like voice and articulation, where you lost your regional accent, which is why you can't tell I'm from Boston when you hear me speak. Uh, it, was a, it was a great time. But the books, I, I actually wrote two books, very, very different. So one I wrote in 2008, it's called Real Bodybuilding, Muscle Truth from 25 Years in the Trenches. That's more or less an instructional book, uh, covers training, nutrition, supplementation, mindset. Uh, and that is, that is I self-published that. You can find it on Amazon or Author House was the uh, self-publishing place. But, you know, I always liked fiction writing. I always liked horror writing. Uh, I've never, I've never been known for it. I've, I did publish a book a couple of years ago called Evil X10. It was supposed to be Evil Times 10. And I realized I should have put some spaces in between before and after the X, because unless you do, unless you do it all as one word, it doesn't come up in any searches. Evil X10, it's a collection of 10 short horror stories I wrote. Uh, and they're, uh, I'm actually more proud of those stories and that book than anything I've written. And that's, I've had thousands of articles published in bodybuilding magazines, but I'm more proud of these because each one of them took a long time, painstaking, went over and over them. And they scare, some of them scare me. And I'm pretty hard to scare because I've been a horror, watching horror movies since I was probably three years old. Uh, very, very disturbing, kind of gruesome, some of them. Um, but I, I'm proud of them because I read a lot of horror and I'm not saying it's up there with Stephen King or anything, but it's it, it's not it's not amateurish. I read a lot of fiction online because anybody can publish anything, and sometimes I'm cringing and stuff. So this is this is a, a work I'm very proud of because it's it's a representation of what I feel my true writing talent is. You know, I'm not saying you don't have to have any talent to do bodybuilding writing, but you sort of have to write for a mass audience. You have to be careful with your vocabulary that you don't use too many words that people might have to look up uh and just I, I like i like being able to create an atmosphere uh a dark frightening atmosphere because that's what i want when i read something a horror a piece of horror or i watch a horror movie i'm always looking for that 
for that foreboding, that fear, something that's really going to get to me and, and bother me. Uh, as weird as that sounds, but that's to me, that's success in horror. If you really bothered somebody, it, it made them, it's something they can't get out of their head. Right, right. <laughs> No, and, and I love it. And, and that's why, you know, I, I just enjoy having these conversations because like we see Ron Harris, the, the bodybuilder guy, but then there's, there's, there's layers to you, just like there's layers to me and there's, there's layers to, to everyone. So um, do you, is there any like correlation or like, you know, have you tied anything between, obviously we, we know that the writing with the magazines and stuff, but like in terms of just like your bodybuilding life and your writing life, is there any similarities? Is there any correlation between the two that you've kind of realized over the years, Ron? I wouldn't say correlation, but I don't think I could have lasted this long as a bodybuilding writer if I wasn't a bodybuilder and it wasn't always on my mind. If I didn't live the lifestyle, I'm able to interview these guys. I, I happen to think the best interviewers in bodybuilding are those who have at least competed a few times, have been through all the things that these athletes have been, because then you can really relate to them. You know, they talk about the diet and how tough it is at the end, or diuretics made me feel this way, you know, trend made me feel this way, or, you know, I hurt my back doing squats. You can relate to everything that these guys have gone through, because especially if you've been doing this a long time, I've been, I've been through almost everything these guys have been through, except of course, you know, being on an Olympia stage or on a classic stage. I never did that, but uh, like I, I could not be a bodybuilding writer. I couldn't, I couldn't be in this industry right now. Still, I would have quit long, long ago if I wasn't a bodybuilder. For sure. Now, before we transition, how you kind of got into the fitness industry and and all of that. Um, when you went off to college, kind of doing the uh, more of like the, the the speaking, the art type stuff. What was kind of like so like in high school? What was what was kind of like your goal to go to college? What were you kind of wanting to, to do before you got into the, to the fitness industry? Honestly, my only goal in college was to get very far away from Boston. I just wanted to travel. I wanted to, I wanted to go to California. So I only applied to uh, the, UC, the UC system, the University of California. I applied to four of them. I got into two and I picked the one that looked cooler, Santa Barbara. That was, they had to have a film studies program. That was the only, that was the only uh, caveat that I was uh, looking for, but I wasn't thinking anything except vaguely. I wanted to work in movies. Didn't have a lot of clear goals. I certainly never thought I'd end up in the fitness industry at that point ever. Right. Right. And was the draw to California, was that specifically just from seeing the magazines and seeing, seeing everybody out there on the beaches and the muscles? Yeah. When you grow up, uh, you know, I grew up in Boston. It's, we have very long, very cold winters, windy, a lot of snow, so you see these people in California on the beach and the palm trees, and it just seems like that's, that's ideal. That's paradise. You know, to For an sure. extent, the, the weather out there was, was fantastic. But, uh, you know, there were other things. Like I lived there for 10 years. I ended up uh, being there from 91 to 2000. So certain aspects of it I enjoyed a lot. Other things, I've been back to visit a couple times since, and I would never want to live in the L.A. area, Southern California now. It's changed right. a lot. Changed a lot. For sure. Yeah, I, I'm... Uh uh, from Iowa and that's, that's where I'm at right now. So I, I grew up, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little, little younger than you, but I grew up with the magazines and all you ever saw was like the guys on the beaches and they were jacked and they had the girls and the cars. And then you have, uh, you know, uh, Gold's Gym Venice and, you know, you see Arnold and Franco working out, out in the sun and like, here I'm in, in Iowa and it's like 20 below and you got a foot of snow and it's like, dude, so I actually, one of my big goals was I was looking at college's uh, you know, out of high school to, to go to um, after I graduated high school. I, I never ended up going out there. I've been obviously out to California uh, numerous times, but it's just kind of funny, like some of us growing up with the magazines, kind of like what the magazine showed, like how much that really played into us as, as young men and, and young people. It's, it's just kind of fascinating and interesting to, to see that, you know, so. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it actually was a bodybuilder paradise for a long time. I caught the tail end of it. I caught I was out there in the 90s. That was probably the very last decade where you had so many bodybuilders from the world converging on uh, that Venice, this little two, four, two or three block area. They all came out and stayed at the Marina Pacific Hotel. They would train at Gold's Gym. They would go eat at the firehouse. They would go walk on the boardwalk. And anytime I went down there, and I, when I lived there, I'd be there almost every weekend down at Venice Beach. You'd see pros from around the US, from around the world, top amateurs. 
they all made that trip at least once a year. So it was pretty cool. You'd walk into Gold's Venice and, you know, here's Mr. Sweden over here. Here's uh, the European champion. Here's uh, someone from Australia. Here's somebody from Florida, New York, Detroit. And they were all in this one place because back then it was the Mecca. Now everybody's scattered to the four winds. You don't need to be any one particular place anymore. Yep, yep. It kind of kind of looks like uh, just from my eyes on social media that uh, Vegas is kind of starting to be a, a little bit of a new Mecca, huh? Yeah, yeah. I think it's property is cheaper out there. The traffic isn't as bad. Yeah, I think a lot of people have soured on LA. It's a, it's just not what it used to be. It's always in a drought. It's just the traffic out there. I mean, that sounds like a minor thing, but it's not if you're, if you're spending hours a day sitting on a freeway. It's, I can't imagine doing that. I'd lose my mind. Right, right, for sure. So let's let's talk about how you got into the fitness industry, Ron, and then we're going to kind of just start unpacking all all the bodybuilding things here. So um, just just touch on. Um, you know, the, the kind of the break that you got, how you got into the fitness industry, and we'll just kind of keep our conversation going in that direction. Sure. So uh, the last semester I did at Emerson, they offered something called the LA semester where you could go out there. You only had to take two classes, I think, and they were in the evening. And that left you free to do an internship in your field of interest, some, some company that was in your, somehow related to what you were studying. And I had been watching this show on ESPN called American Muscle Magazine. It was a monthly one-hour show, magazine format. They did contest coverage, athlete profiles, workouts. They had cooking. They had fashion, gossip. It was really like a magazine. And I, you know, I used to tape it and watch it on VHS over and over again. I said, let me try to see if this company, American Sports Network, if they'd take me for an internship. So I sent my little demo tape off and my resume off to the, to the uh, executive producer, the owner of the company, a guy named Lou Zwick. And sure enough, he said, come on down. And immediately, I was only supposed to be there like 15 hours a week. Immediately, he wanted me there 40 hours a week, had me doing all kinds of odd jobs. And then, so that was January 91. I was only supposed to be in California till I think end of April or beginning of May, I think it was May, beginning of May, the semester was over now. I was supposed to go back to Boston, but I never went home because he offered me a position to work there. And I was in, I was like, wow, okay. So immediately I was, uh, I was writing scripts for this show uh, that was being broadcast all over the world. I'm 21 years old, just even while I was still in school, I wasn't even out of school yet. And then a couple of the guys that were associate producers I mean, they would go out and film the segments and go back and edit them. Uh, they didn't quite quit, but they were sort of disgruntled. So they stopped doing as much work. And I was asked to come in and fill in for them. So I stepped into that position, associate producer. So I was going to the contests. I was going uh, filming bodybuilders down at the gyms, Golds and Worlds in Venice, different places. Uh, it was really a, one of those things, fake it till you make it. I, just, I had no idea what I was doing, but you know, I've asked enough questions and the camera guys would always help me out. And I had a basic idea of like video framing and things like that. So that's, that's it. That's how I met uh, a lot of the athletes. Cause Lou was, Lou Zwick was an amazing talent scout. He had an eye for talent. Almost everyone of that era he had on that show long before they were famous guys like Lev Roney, Yates, Flex Wheeler, Dennis Newman, Mike Francois. You could go on and on Franco Santorillo. You could go on and list Two, two or 300 athletes that he, on that, he had on that show, either before they were pros or before anybody really know, knew or cared who they were. So I got to know all them. I got to know the supplement company owners, the magazine uh, owners, the photographers. Uh, that's where I made all my contacts uh, that I, you know, would serve me later on as I, as I left and became a writer. But I did that for eight years. I did that for eight years, that show. Okay. So... I mean, I, one of the reasons why I, I enjoy you, know, you interviewing and stuff, Ron, because I, you're like, you're, you, you kind of give people like myself, who's just like a huge bodybuilding fan. It's like, I can kind of see myself in you when you're talking to these athletes, you know, and interviewing, because like, you're, you're a passionate guy. Like, you, yes, you're a bodybuilder, but you're also a fan. It's like, you, you, you kind of like, you, you're that guy that kind of gets to go behind the curtain that a lot of us wish we could or had an opportunity. So when you had that opportunity, uh, you know, initially when you got into the fitness industry, were you just like, were you just kind of like 
in awe and just kind of blown away. That's like, whoa, like here I was looking at all these guys in the magazines, watching, you know, pumping iron. It's like, literally I'm here interviewing these guys. I get to interact with these guys. What was kind of like your mindset when you had that opportunity initially? Yeah, I was certainly starstruck. Cause like I said, I had started reading the magazines in late 87. So the first year I was working for uh, the, the show American Muscle, I would meet guys like I was on, I was part of the, the video shoot that Lee Haney did for his, his workout video that he was doing for Twin Lab at the time. So I got to meet Lee a few months before he won his eighth and final Olympia. I met Rich Gaspari that year, Lee Labrada. I had already met Gary Stride and Mike Christian. But, you know, because back then, before social media, before YouTube, uh, these, these men had an air of mystique about them. They were larger than life because the only access we had were those magazines, which just gave you a little snapshot. You didn't really know them as people. You didn't know about their day-to-day -day lives. You'd see training shots of them. You'd see competition pictures of them. But you never really, you didn't hear them speak unless you bought a video or saw them on this, this show. So yeah, for me, it was just, it was crazy because I wasn't, still am a fan. And again, like, like I said, if I wasn't a bodybuilder, I couldn't do this. If I wasn't a fan of the sport, I would have stopped doing this a long time ago. When I run into occasionally people that work in the bodybuilding media, that I can tell have no interest in the actual sport. I don't know how they do it. It's like, I couldn't write about, I couldn't cover golf or I couldn't cover NASCAR because I just don't care. It doesn't interest me, but you know, bodybuilding, I still look forward to, wow, who's going to be in the Olympia this year? Oh, who's getting ready for this show? How are they looking? How are they going to stack up? You know, I hope he looks better than last time. I hope he brought this body part. I hope the condition and at the contest, I'm still, I'm still like a little kid there what you know comparing the guys and trying to figure out how they're going to how they're going to place to me it's exciting because I don't follow other sports I'm very much unlike the typical American male I don't watch football I don't watch baseball basketball I could care less about any of those things I never had you know my late father was not into sports maybe that's why he never passed on that nobody passed on that love of sports to me but I don't care about pro sports but when I watch bodybuilding that's I get excited. I know what the judges are looking for. I know what the athletes are supposed to look like. And, you know, I always want to see how it's going to turn up, who brought the best package that day, who's going to unseat who that to me, that's, that's my sport. I know. And then that, like, and that's that kind of what I said. That's, that's why I just love uh, and appreciate kind of just the, the way you approach your interviews and you do things. Cause it's, it is from a bodybuilder's perspective and a fan's perspective. And I think that's a unique perspective um, from my, my estimation. Now, um, before we kind of get into, uh, you know, the magazines and, and stuff like that, I want to, I want to touch on your own, uh, you know, bodybuilding journey, so to speak a little bit, Ron. So did you, cause I, obviously you've been bodybuilding for years and years, and I know from listening some to, to some of your content on, uh, muscular development, you're, you're kind of going through, uh, you're, 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 you're getting a little bit shredded right now for the first time in a while. Uh, I think just kind of for the fun of it is what you've said, but, um, as, at, at what was kind of like the bodybuilding for you? What, like kind of what type of training did you do? Uh, what was your nutrition like for you personally? Um, and then uh, did you ever have aspirations to, to become a pro? Yeah, I certainly had aspirations to become a pro, of course. I think everybody does. Um, it's like if you're putting all this time and effort and work into it, you want something at the end of it. It's like, why would you go to college for years and years if you're not going to get a degree? To me, that's kind of like that. But uh, so I started training as a bodybuilder, meaning working the whole body when I was 18. I did my first contest when I was 19, March of 1989. I competed for a couple of years in an organization called ANBC. It was a lifetime natural bodybuilding organization based out of Rhode Island. Most of their shows were up and down the eastern seaboard of the USA. So I did a few of those. Uh, when I moved to California, uh, I did a couple of their shows they had out there. Did another organization called ABCC. Then I found the NPC. They had just started putting on these natural shows called Iron Man Naturally through Iron Man Magazine, which I had started writing for a couple of years previous. So that just seemed like a great fit. Did that. Um, did the Muscle Beach show out in LA a bunch of times. They have a show right there out on the beach in the open under the on the boardwalk um, every Memorial Day, Fourth of July, and Labor Day. I did a bunch of those, had a lot of fun. Uh, and then when I moved back to Boston in 2000, I didn't compete for a couple of years, competed in the NPC, uh, start, did my first NPC show back here, 2002, New England, took second in the heavyweights there, did a bunch, did, did a few NPC shows, 
Didn't go to the national level to 2009, did my first team universe, didn't do very well. Came back in 2011, moved up a class to heavyweights, took second there, and uh, did a couple more. But the last time I competed was 2013. I did uni team universe masters, took fifth out of 24 of us, and there was no weight limit. It was just everybody under, everybody 40, you know, everybody from 40 to 50 was one class. Uh, and then I did masters nationals two weeks later, and that's been it. But uh, training, man, I mean, I don't think my training is anything too different, too crazy from from uh, the standard. For most, a long part, a long time, I trained four days a week because I was all about recovery. So body part would get hit once a week. I did it Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Those are my training days, and it was always chest, either with biceps or triceps, back by itself legs by itself, and then shoulders with either biceps or triceps. I did that split for many years. Did a lot of lower rep training in my 20s for sure, which I don't know if it was the smartest idea. I think I'm, I think I'm paying for it later in life. I did a lot of three to six, three to six rep sets. Got, I was very, very strong in a lot of, in some movements anyway. Um, but, you know, now I, I don't train like that anymore. I don't do anything under eight reps would be my absolute minimum now. There's... I'm not trying to put those kind of loads on my joints anymore. Uh, yeah, nutrition, it took me a while to figure out. I'd say the biggest mistake I made with nutrition that I try to keep others is bulking up, bulking up and getting fat. I used to spend every, every winter, every fall and winter just bloated, eating and stuffing as much food down as possible. You know, probably probably going well over a thousand, two thousand, maybe two thousand calories a day over maintenance level. So you can imagine how fat I was getting. And you know, looking back, I, I wish I hadn't done that. I don't think it was necessary. I don't think it was helpful. I could have made the same gains with a lot less body fat. And every, you know, it took me a few times of dieting down and looking exactly the same to realize all that weight I'd put on that I thought was muscle was not muscle at all. It was fat and water that I had added. And, and that though kind of was like, you know, I know when I was reading the magazines growing up and everything, that was kind of like back in the day, uh, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. That was kind of like what you saw in the magazines, though, right? Like you'd see a lot of these, you know, obviously the pros or top NPC competitors, like they would get like I remember seeing pictures of like Lee Priest, you know what I mean? Back then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be like, you know, 75, 100 pounds over what they would be competing at on stage. So I guess you know, it's not necessarily your fault or anything, because that's what I used to do too. Uh, you know, you just like eat and eat and eat. You got to, you got to eat to get big. And, and uh, that's kind of what we, we saw in the magazines. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, like turning pro and stuff, was there a point where you just kind of feel like, you know what, like this probably isn't going to happen. And I'm just going to kind of like transition into other things, or do you kind of still have um, you know, an itch to compete at some point, where are you at kind of with the, the competing Ron? Honestly, I'm not, I'd like to compete again, but it's not a priority for me. I know that I couldn't do my best job preparing for a show and do the best job as editor, online editor and senior writer for MD. I couldn't do them both at the same time. And you know, what's paying the bills for me? What's, what's more important. I can't prioritize a pro, a pro card wouldn't add a penny to my checking account. It would be a nice little badge of honor, a nice little feather in my cap. I could change my Instagram handle to Ron Harris IFBB Pro, but it wouldn't it wouldn't add anything else. Do I still want it? Of course, I still want it. Many of the guys that I've beaten over the years, they're pros now, and I see people in Masters Classic, which I shouldn't even use as an example because I can't get down to that weight. I'm 35 pounds over that weight now, and I don't have 35 pounds to lose for my height in the NPC, but I see some physiques out there that I'm like, well, if that's a pro, I have a better physique than that. I should be a pro, which is, you know, it sounds like sour grapes. So, but if it was that important to me, I would be, I would be going after it. It's just not, it's not that important to me. I'd like to do it, but nah, do I need it? Nah, nah. Right. Now uh, you mentioned uh, kind of like you picked up uh, the Arthur Jones Nautilus books, like when you're 18, earlier in our conversation. Um, and I've also heard you talk about uh, Dorian Yates. I think he was probably a big influence in terms of the way that you train. Uh, outside of Arthur Jones and Dorian Yates, were there any other people that you uh, really kind of based some of your training and, and bodybuilding lifestyle off of? 
Yeah, I would say for sure, Dorian Yates, Mike Mentzer were both big influences on me. Um, Mike Mentzer, again, going back to the Arthur Jones thing about intensity, you know, he really put it in my head that you need to train harder every time than you trained last time, which is almost impossible to really do. But it, it, it made me think about setting the bar for yourself higher every time, or at least trying to. Another influence later on was uh, Dante Trudell with DC training because he really put that idea back in my head about trying to get stronger. Unfortunately, at that time, I was already in my late thirties. So my joints are already really starting to go on me. I, I wish I'd found that system maybe 10 years before when my, when my joints would have been more, uh, were healthier and would have, would have gotten along better with that progressive overload every workout. But uh, I, I've tried to take a little bit from everybody. Cause I think everybody out there, who has a lot of experience training, whether they're a so, so-called expert or not, everyone's got something that you can take away. Like when I'm in the gym, I'll watch people. I'm always looking for ideas. If I see someone doing an exercise, maybe they're doing it not the, not the best way it's supposed to be, but they saw it somewhere. And I'll say, let me try that next time and see if I can make it feel right or improve upon it. You know, you never stop learning. I think the day, the day you think you know it all, and that, that probably goes for any avenue, not just bodybuilding, you're done. You should always, always keep an open mind, always realize that there's something you don't know yet. There's something out there you haven't tried or done that could probably help you reach a higher level at whatever it is your goals are. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to, we're, I want to kind of like, uh, wrap up our conversation, Ron. So I, I just want to talk about how you, uh, kind of transition into writing for the magazines and, uh, and then kind of like end with, uh, you know, muscular development, where you're at currently. So just share with myself and the listeners kind of how you got into the magazine writing and then how you transitioned uh, over to muscular development, kind of taking care of all the online stuff. Sure. So uh, early 1992, I was working the American Muscle Job and I was down at the Ironman Magazine headquarters in Marina Del Rey at the time. And we were, I was filming Lonnie Teeper doing a preview of the pro Ironman show that was going to happen that year. And I met Steve Holman, uh, the owner of the, the owner of the magazine. He owned it along with Mike Nevue. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, John Balick, and he was the owner. And Steve Holman was the editor. And I, I took Steve aside for a second. I said, Steve, um, how does one go about writing for your magazine? How can I submit something? And he said, you know, fax it to this number. This is back when we had fax machines. There was no email yet. There was no internet yet. So I, I, I came up with a little something, fax it to him. And he said, sure, send me an invoice. I'm like, invoice, all right, great. So I did that on the side. I started writing for Iron Man. This is all while I, I did all this on the side for years while I was doing the TV job. Next magazine after Iron Man that I got in, that I got in with was Muscle Mag International. I did a ton of work for Bob Kennedy and Gino, aka Johnny Fitness, over the years. They were very good to me. They gave me a lot of assignments. And, you know, my goal ultimately, as as I got near the end of that TV job, I didn't want to do it anymore. I just I wasn't enjoying it. I liked the writing a lot more but I needed to have enough writing to make it a, make a living at it. And um, I ended up getting fired or quit from a TV job to this day. That's still in contention as to what happened, but I, I had to take a job as a personal trainer for about a year and a half. And, and while I was doing that, I was writing constantly, but my goal was I need to be making enough money to pay all the family bills. You know, I had two kids that by that time and uh, it, by the end of 2000, by fall of 2000, I had enough, I had enough work. So we sold our house and I came back to Boston and I continued writing for the magazines and how I got in with muscular development was there used to be a writer called the sandwich. That's what he went by. His real name was Josh. He was known as having these very outrageous interviews where he would, especially with female athletes where he would ask very cringy questions, looking back at it now, sexual type of questions and stuff. And he also was a ghost writer for a few of the bodybuilder columns in the magazine. He was getting tired of doing that. So he said, do you want to write these? You know, I'm getting, he subcontracted me. He was taking some of the money and he was giving me more than half of it. So I started doing that for him. Uh, and then one day he had an assignment he didn't want. It was an interview with Jenna Jameson. Uh, at the time, she was a top adult film star in the world. And he didn't want to do it. And he knew I had done a couple, a couple interviews with adult film stars for, I did one for two for, one for Muscle Mag, two for Testosterone. Um, anyway, did the interview, uh, they accepted, and, I, and that was the first thing I had in MD under my own name, and from there, it sort of snowballed. 
uh, sandwich, Josh, he didn't want to do the columns anymore. So I sort of took over and started doing a bunch of the athlete columns. So that was 2000, uh, geez, 2001. I'd say by 2004, 2005, I had a ton of work from MD. By a couple of years later, I had so much work from them that I was asked uh, not to write for other magazines. So even though I wasn't officially on the staff of MD and I wouldn't be until t- early 2017, uh, I actually enjoyed those years where I was just a writer, honestly, more because I sort of made my own schedule and uh, it wasn't it wasn't as uh, competitive. I wasn't competing so much with other writers where once I entered this job and I was offered the job in 2017 that the first person to hold the job was Dave Palumbo. And then there was, there was a few others who had it in between then and I took it on. But, you know, then I became responsible for all the online contest coverage, the video content, things like that. And it was a lot more, it was a lot more involved for sure. And I'm the only online editor that still does all the writing. None of those other guys did more than like one column. Like, you know, Dave did like one column a month. Most of them didn't do any writing at all. Um, So I used to do all the writing that I used to do every month. Plus on top of that, I still do all this for the website and the YouTube channel. And I'm at these shows. We don't cover a ton of shows, but I need to be there. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the guy. That's me. (laughs) For sure. Yeah. And, and I think it's just awesome, you know, because there's been a lot of different websites and a lot of different magazines and a lot of different contest coverage over the years. And, and you and, and Musker Development are kind of have stood the test of time. And I think it's so cool that you guys still go to these pro contests and, and you interview the, 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 the athletes and stuff, because it's just something, especially back in the early 2000s, it was, a, it was an awesome part uh, of, of the bodybuilding culture. So just to wrap things up here, Ron, kind of one last question I want to ask you, um, you know, in, in terms of IFBB pro uh, men's bodybuilders, who are some of the up and comers, some of the younger guys, this next generation crop that you're excited to see over the next two, three, four years uh, mature and uh, compete on the Olympia stage? So two guys, I'm really looking forward to seeing what they're going to be able to do are Nick Walker and Hunter Labrada. Um, Sergio Oliva too, he's a little older though, but we're, now we're talking about younger guys. Nick Walker in particular, you know, I've seen him at both. He's only done these two pro shows so far, but the potential on him is this enormous. I could see him, I don't want to say winning in Olympia because I've said that in the past about guys like Levroni and Flex Wheeler and Sean Ray, and they never won in Olympia. But uh, I think he's going to be so good. And I think I see the same thing with Hunter. They both have, what we used to say, they have their head on a good head on their shoulders. They've, they've got everything in priority. They're hard workers. They, they do what needs to be done. They improve. Every time you see them, they're better and better and they don't make excuses. They have great attitudes, just uh, the whole package, you know, mental attitude, genetics, work ethic. Those, those would be my top two guys. I'm sure there's more, you know, classic is another division. There's so many, I, I can't wait to see what Bumstead's got in store for us this year, because he made such a leap from 2019 to 2020, even if he's only 5% better this year, that's going to be amazing to see. And you got other guys in the division like Terrence Ruffin, Alex Cumbernero, Steve Lorius, uh, geez, 212, you got guys like Lunsford coming up the ranks, uh, so many others. It's There's always, that, that's, that's what's exciting about it is no matter how long you've been in it, there's always going to be this transition where the older athletes sort of walk away into the sunset and then you have all this new talent coming in. And it's great to watch them blossom because some of them don't pan out. Some of them, for whatever reasons, don't live up to expectations, but others live up to and surpass your expectations. I actually get more of a kick out of people, something like a, like a Brandon Curry that I had sort of written off. Like, eh, you know, five years ago, if you told me Brandon Curry was going to be Mitchell Olympia, I'd be like, no, come on, what are you smoking? So people that I'd sort of given up on because they never showed the condition or they never made the improvements in body parts. And then all of a sudden they do. And it's refreshing. I love being proved wrong when I say he's never, someone's, you know, uh, if they don't have a back and they've been a pro for five years, are they ever going to have a back? But sometimes they figure it out. Like I'm looking forward to seeing Akim Williams right now. Um, He's someone that a few years ago, I never thought was going to be someone we were talking about in contention for top, top three at the Olympia, but he's getting there. He was sixth place last year. So yeah, it's exciting for me as a fan to watch new talent and even older talent that I had sort of written off, make this, these vast leaps and improvement. 
For sure. So Ron, uh, I just want to thank you uh, again for taking some time uh, out of your, your Saturday morning to jump on the podcast with me, share a little bit of your story, share a little bit of your insight and passion. If any of my listeners want to uh, reach out to you, if they want to find out more about what uh, you and muscular development have going on on all your platforms, where can people touch base with you and muscular development? Sure. So we have a, a website, still musculardevelopment.com. We have a forum on there called the Noble Forum, where people can discuss different topics or argue, debate. Our YouTube channel is Muscular Development. That's where I put all my content out for muscular development. That's where we have Ron Line Report, MD Global Muscle, uh, the training things, all kinds of contest coverage. We have thousands and thousands of video on there. I have my own personal Instagram, at Ron Harris Muscle. And we also, of course, have the MD Instagram, at Muscular Development. So any of those, appreciate any new followers, especially with the YouTube. We're always looking for more viewers. It's, YouTube is very competitive these days, as you know. <laughs> for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ron. And 127 Fit Podcast listeners, once again, I just want to thank you so very much for your listening ears. They're always greatly appreciated. If you would like to find out more about the guests that I'm bringing onto the podcast or myself personally, you can find that information on Instagram at 127 Fit. Facebook is Quentin Vars. If you guys would do a huge favor and please leave a five-star written review, especially within the iTunes, Apple podcast app that would be so cool that's how more people find the podcast more people listen to the podcast and more people are positively impacted through the stories that my guests are sharing if you would also do one other favor and take this episode or a previous episode of the 127 fit podcast that you found great value in and share that episode or episodes on your social media story platforms I would greatly appreciate that. If you think you would be a great guest or if you have a friend or an acquaintance you think would be a great guest or guest for the 127 Fit Podcast, please send me an email or give this email out. The email is 127fit at gmail.com. And then per the usual, I will leave you with Proverbs 2410, which states, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. This time until next time, I'll catch you guys later.